topic, we're going to have a look at active transport. So by the end of this topic, you should be able to answer the questions, what is active transport? What is the mechanism of active transport? What are the different protein pumps? What are the requirements of active transport? What factors affect the rate of active transport? And then we're going to have a look at the examples, reabsorption of glucose in the kidney, guard cells opening, loading sucrose into phloem, and then finally, what are the differences between the different transport mechanisms? So here you've got a cell. The purple dots represent ions. You can see that the concentration of the ions is much higher inside the cell compared to the environment. So how are these ions entering the cell? It's by a process called active transport. So they're moving against their concentration gradient through the cell membrane. Now for them to do this, they need energy in the form of ATP and special biological pumps. So what's the definition of active transport? It's the movement of molecules or ions into or out of a cell from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration using energy from ATP and it also uses carrier molecules. So keywords to remember are from low to high, ATP and carrier molecules. So how is it different to passive transport? Well, if you look at this diagram, you'll notice the differences between active transport on the right and passive transport on the left. So have a look and see what differences you can pick up. The first is that active transport uses metabolic energy in the form of ATP. The materials are moving against a concentration gradient and the carrier proteins are acting as pumps. And then lastly, the process is selective with specific substances being transported. Okay, let's have a look at the mechanism of active transport. So active transport involves carrier proteins which span the plasma membrane and they accept the molecules or ions to be transported on one side of the membrane. So the molecules or ions bind to the receptors on the channels of the carrier protein. ATP is split into ADP and inorganic phosphate. As a result the protein molecule changes shape and the molecules or ions are released on the other side of the membrane. Then inorganic phosphate is released from the protein and so it recombines with ADP to form ATP. The protein is then reverted back to its original shape. Okay, let's have a look at the different pumps. You've got two types, you've got primary and secondary pumps. The primary pumps include uniport pumps, which transport one molecule across the membrane, antiport pumps, which transport two different molecules in different directions, and then symport, which pumps two different molecules in the same direction across the membrane, and your secondary pumps, which are indirect active transport. Okay, starting off with primary pumps, these are protein carrier molecules. And the ion or molecule attaches to one side, the carrier molecule reacts with ATP, so it changes shape, and then the ion or molecule is released on the other side. So a uniport pump attaches to a specific molecule ion on one side of the membrane, the carrier protein reacts with ATP and undergoes a change in shape. So the ion is transported to the other side against the diffusion gradient. So it only involves one molecule or ion. So here's an example, a proton pump. An antiport carrier molecule transports two different molecules in different directions. For example, the sodium-potassium pump. In a nerve cell, these pump three sodium out and two potassium ions into the neuron. This creates a potential difference across the neuron. Then you have symport. These transport two different molecules in the same direction across a membrane. 
care and secondary pumps. Secondary pumps are also called indirect active transport. So the primary pump is used to pump an iron out of the cell. This sets up a diffusion gradient called a co-transporter molecule. Oh, sorry, this sets up a diffusion gradient through a co-transporter molecule. So the diffusion gradient provides enough energy for the iron to pull another molecule with it through the co-transported molecule in the cell. So if you have a look here, the sodium-potassium pump, sodium's pumped out, this creates a diffusion gradient. So as sodium diffuses back through the co-transporter protein, it's going to pull sugar with it. So what are the requirements for active transport? Certain conditions are necessary if a cell is to carry out active transport. So these include any fact that affects the respiratory rate, such as the presence of numerous mitochondria, a steady supply of ATP, and a high respiratory rate. So what factors will affect the rate of active transport? Any factor that affects the respiratory rate will have an effect on the active transport. This means an increase in temperature or supply of oxygen will increase the rate of active transport. So what do you think will decrease the rate of active transport? Will a decrease in temperature, decrease in the supply of oxygen, and respiratory inhibitors such as cyanide will inhibit active transport. Okay, we're going to move on to examples of active transport. These include reabsorption of glucose in the kidney, guard cells opening, and loading sucrose into phloem. Starting off with the first one, reabsorption of glucose in the kidney. So inside the kidney you have tiny structures called nephrons. So it's here that filtering of the blood occurs. So our bodies need to reabsorb the glucose so that it doesn't get released in urine. So selective reabsorption occurs here. This is where glucose gets reabsorbed back into the blood. So if you zoom in to the cells surrounding the tubules, you'll see this. These cells lie very closely to the capillaries and help with reabsorption of glucose back into the blood. Now what is the process? The first is that sodium is pumped out of the cells lining the kidney tubule into the blood using ATP. There's now a low concentration of sodium in the cell, so where or what is going to happen next? Sodium is going to diffuse down its concentration gradient and as it does this it carries glucose with it through a co-transporter molecule. Glucose can now diffuse into the blood. So the steps involve active transport, followed by diffusion and co-transportation of glucose, and then finally the diffusion of glucose back into the blood. Guard cells opening. If you remember the structure of a leaf, on the lower epidermis are guard cells that surround an opening called a stoma. The way in which these guard cells open and close depends on active transport of protons. So here's a guard cell that's closed. Now in order for the stoma to um, be in an open state, protons are pumped out by a proton pump using ATP. This creates an electropotential gradient. So potassium can now diffuse down the gradient. And the water potential in the cell is now decreased. So water moves into the cell by osmosis. So if water moves into the cell, what do you think is going to happen to the guard cell? It's going to become turgid so that the stomata open. Loading sucrose into phloem. Now if you remember, in the vascular bundle you'll find phloem, which transports sucrose. So sucrose needs to enter the phloem sieve tube elements, and it does this by active transport. So protons are pumped out of the companion cell using ATP. The protons then diffuse down their concentration gradient back into the companion cell, and they diffuse through a co-transporter molecule 
And as they do this, they pull sucrose with it. So they co-transport sucrose. So zooming in on the membrane, you can see the proton pump and the co-transporter protein. Sucrose can now diffuse into the phloem tube through the plasmodesmata. So what are the differences between the different transport mechanisms that we've looked at? So this is quite a nice table that I want you to copy down because it summarizes the differences. Okay, diffusion. Does it occur against a concentration gradient? No. Does it need energy from ATP? No. Me um, does it use carrier molecules? No. What about facilitated diffusion? Does it occur against a concentration gradient? No. Need ATP? No. Use carrier molecules? Yes. Osmosis? Occur against a concentration gradient? No. Need energy? No. May use carrier molecules? No. And then active transport. Occur against a concentration gradient? Yes. Need energy from ATP? Yes. And use carrier molecules? Yes. So in summary, we've looked at simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and today we looked at active transport, which uses a carrier protein and ATP. So just to recap on what we've looked at in this lesson, what is active transport? It's the movement of molecules or ions into or out of a cell from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration using energy from ATP and also uses carrier molecules. What's the mechanism of active transport? Well, we looked at the different steps, which involve ATP binding to a protein pump, and then the ATP gets split into ADP and an organic phosphate. This causes the pump to change shape and deliver the ions or molecules onto the other side of the cell. What are the different protein pumps? We looked at primary pumps, which include uniport, symport, and antiport. And then we also looked at secondary pumps. What are the requirements of active transport and what factors affect the rate of active transport? Can you remember these? The different requirements for active transport include mitochondria, ATP and high respiratory rate. So factors such as temperature, oxygen supply and respiratory inhibitors will affect the rate of respiration. So we looked at examples of active transport which include reabsorption of glucose in the kidney, involving co-transportation with sodium, guard cells opening involving protons and potassium ions, and loading of sucrose into phloem involving co-transportation with prote uh, protons and sucrose. And then lastly, we compared diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. And that concludes our lesson. The end.